<clears throat> hello, hello. Uh, this podcast is about marketing, yes, and I just want to say this is going to be the first time I am attempting to record a video while also recording a podcast because typically we always record our obviously our guest episodes because those are done on zoom um but i've never recorded myself doing a solo so if this works we're on youtube if it doesn't you'll never see it um but anyhow let's see how this goes i'm just having my earl gray tea it's kind of like my mid-morning um cocktail if you will i love having an earl gray tea with a little bit of milk and lately I've actually been trying to start my morning a bit healthier. I'm not having coffee first thing. I heard somewhere that something to do with cortisone, I don't really know the science, but I believed it. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna hold off until I've had food in my belly before I have my coffee. So that's my new thing. And then I have a tea midday and sometimes in the afternoon, um, though I'm trying to scale back on the caffeine. Anyhow, that is not what today's episode's about. Um, but hit me up on Instagram if you are also trying to prioritize your health this year. <laughs> One of the other things I'm trying to do is eliminate alcohol again. Uh, so far, so good, but it's um, that's a whole other podcast, I think. I wanted to talk today about... It's really hard to hold this. I'm used to having a table where the microphone is. And so I'm trying to hold it. My husband's gonna be like, that's not the type of microphone that you hold, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I wanna talk about marketing because I think that, or I know that right now, a lot of interior designers, decorators, creative entrepreneurs, and business owners in general are a little bit nervous about the economy. I don't think it's been officially declared as of this recording we're in a recession, but I think it's pretty freaking clear that we're in a recession. Um, and you know, no two recessions are the same. And so it's, it's challenging to really know and understand how things are going to pan out, but we're not here to predict the future. We're not economists, but we are here to prepare our businesses for what is to come. And so one of the, and I said it before in the introduction, but one of the first areas that people tend to cut back on or businesses tend to cut back on is expenses. And what's one of the first expenses to be cut back when times are slow? Marketing. Because it's almost seen as not frivolous, that's not the word, but it is seen as almost a luxury because you want to obviously retain the clients you have. And so you want to invest in your team in delivering your service. And so quite often marketing feels like, well, that's a little bit of an extra. As long as I keep going with the status quo, I'm fine. But I actually believe that if you can carve out a little bit of time or and or money, because remember, sometimes it's time, but sometimes you pay someone else so that you have the time to deliver your service, your product. Um, because sometimes if you keep investing in the marketing, that's how you're gonna stay front and center in pe people's minds. And that is how you are going to continue to stay in business and hopefully even grow. So I want to share with you today a couple things, sort of two sort of thoughts um, that have circled around a lot in conversations lately when it comes to marketing your business. And these are not brand new ideas. These are not like, oh my God, I never thought of that. I mean, maybe you've not heard of it before, but these are ideas that exist in the introverse. Is that even a word? I don't even know. And, um, but I think they're worthy of a reminder because marketing <clears throat> at its core is about getting in front of the people that you want to serve and letting them know, A, that you exist and B, you can solve their problem. That is marketing 101. It is ultimately about solving people's problems. If you have a product or a service, what is the problem that you offer a solution for, right? Like, I don't want my teeth to rot and decay and have to spend thousands of dollars at the dentist. Oh, how about a toothbrush and a toothpaste? Everybody needs that. Here we go. And then you can get fancy. Our toothbrush has 
is colored and it vibrates and you know, you get the picture. Or maybe, for example, my online course, Power of Process, great example. What is the problem I solve? The problem is that designers are running around like chickens with their head cut off, feeling stressed, overrun, tired, and struggling sometimes to keep their clients happy, feeling exhausted. So what does the course do? It teaches you how to set up systems in your business in the supportive community so that you can take back control of your time, make more money, and get those raving fan clients. That is my solution to a problem. There's lots of examples out there in the world. And I think when we are dealing with a luxury service, the way we do with interior design, we need to be extra, we need to sharpen that pencil. We need to get extra clear, razor, laser focused on what is that problem we solve because it's not like brushing your teeth. If you don't decorate your house, your teeth aren't gonna fall out, you know. But is your relationship gonna continue to experience frustration because there's no drop zone at the front and everybody's shoes and I trip over my husband's shoes every morning and frick one day I'm just gonna say that's it I'm leaving you because your shoes are in the way I mean maybe not but you never know so you need to really get super clear on what the problem is that you are solving with your service and a really great way to dive deeper into this is by using a strategy. And I'm gonna share that strategy in a minute. I have talked about it here on the podcast. I'm gonna reference where you can go back and find out more about it. But before I dive into that strategy, I just want to get you, get the wheels turning and thinking about the service that you do offer. And, you know, it could be staging. It could be color consultations. It could be complete reno and decor. It could be decorating only. It could be window treatments. It could be that you supply flooring. Like maybe you're not even a designer and you're just a creative and you're a photographer, or maybe you are a graphic designer. I don't know who's listening to this podcast. I imagine everyone listening is a creative entrepreneur. And so I need you to think about what is it exactly that you offer? And then how are you different? than the competition. Because today's episode is about standing out from the competition. I really wanna talk about that. Um, Before we dive into that, I want to say one caveat. I don't want this episode to be like your permission slip to go down a rabbit hole on Instagram and start feeling super sorry for yourself because you see everybody else and they appear to be doing everything so much better. That is not the point of today. The today point, the today's, the today point, because that makes no sense at all, is to think about you. How are you unique versus the collective competition? Because comparing yourself to individuals in the marketplace just never really serves you unless you have, and I talk about this I actually talk about this inside Momentum, which is my marketing course that I have not offered offered in over a year or two, maybe. I'm, I'm thinking of bringing it back this year. We need to overhaul it and update it, but I've seen it be really a really helpful tool for designers. Um, but I, I talk about this idea of really taking time to look at the competition with a supervisor, uh, meaning someone who's going to keep you in check so you don't go down that spiral of like, oh my God, I'm not good enough. Because you know we all do it. I do it. Hold on, guys, my Earl Grey tea. Okay, so the strategy. What is the strategy to understand how I am different and how I can stand out amongst the competition? The strategy, I did not make it up. I did not coin it. It is called the Blue Ocean Strategy. It is an incredible book. It is, I'm going to just try and find the author of the book because that would be helpful. Oh, come on, Rebecca. I'm looking at my papers right now. Come on. Well, you're going to have to Google it. I should have been prepared. Um, It's such a good book. Huh. It's not here. Okay. Well, I highly recommend you give it a read. I will tell you, however, it's a bit of a heavy read. So I'm just gonna summarize here today um, why I think it's a useful strategy. I actually did an entire podcast episode about this strategy in total depth, 
uh, and maybe I, maybe I mentioned the name of the author there. Um, and it is, hold on. It is, wait for it, wait for it. Episode number two. Oh my gosh, episode number two? Our second freebie, episode two, episode number two, guys. Holy moly, okay. Which is so interesting that I recorded this as the second episode of my podcast because that was 2020 at a time when everyone was panicked and wanted marketing. Huh, history repeats itself a little. Okay, go to RebeccaHay.com forward slash two and you can download a PDF that will help you understand the strategy. But right now I'm just gonna walk you through the key, um, the key points or, or what really this strategy is all about. So essentially, as I mentioned, con comparison is the thief of joy, right? As soon as we stop comparing ourselves to others and we start looking within us, our business, what we do, our business will actually be better off. And I know that that can be hard to understand, but by what, by looking at what makes us and our company unique, that's when we can leverage those unique strengths to really elevate and grow our business. The blue ocean strategy essentially compares the, creates this idea behind competition being a red ocean, like a bloody ocean. I know it's kind of a gross visual, but if you think about a sea and everybody fighting each other for the same piece of the pot, and so it's red, it's filled with boats or people or whatever is swimming around in that ocean. And they are the industries that are really in existence today, right? That's the known market space. In a red ocean, industry boundaries are defined, accepted, and the competitive rules of the game are known. I'm taking this from the book. In the book, they say, here in this red ocean, companies try to outperform their rivals to grab a greater share of existing demand. As the market space gets crowded, profits and growth are reduced. Products become commodities, leading to cutthroat or quote-unquote bloody competition. Hence the term red ocean. So, okay, makes sense, right? You're like, okay, Rebecca, yeah, I get it. Like competition, like McDonald's and Harvey's and Burger King or, uh, I don't know, telephone companies, I was going to say, but let's be honest, up in Canada, they kind of have a monopoly, um, right? Gas stations, let's say. Although I also think they're all in cahoots and they're priced, what's the word when you price fix? So those are bad examples, but you can think of your own. <laughs> the idea is that we want to be in a blue ocean. My favorite color to design with, blue. So this is what the book says. It says blue oceans in contrast denote all the industries not in existence today the unknown market space, untainted by competition. In blue oceans, demand is created rather than fought over. There is ample opportunity for growth that is both profitable and rapid. In blue oceans, competition is irrelevant because the rules of the game are waiting to be set. A blue ocean is an analogy to describe the wider, deeper potential to be found in unexplored market space. A blue ocean is vast, deep, and powerful in terms of profitable growth. So some examples of blue oceans in history would be Apple computers, Virgin Airways, Porter Airlines. You get the idea. These are companies that are thinking so far outside the box. They're offering a service in a very unique way, at least at the onset, right? Because now I would imagine there's more competition for each of those examples. Um, maybe not Apple. How can you redefine what it is that you do in an industry that is saturated IAF? I'm trying not to swear. With interior designers. Like right now, I would guess the most of you listening are in North America. And there might be a few of you from across the pond. <clears throat> there's a lot of designers. Like, even though I know so many designers in Toronto, I feel like I know almost everyone. I at least know people from Instagram or magazines. And then I know a lot of designers because of our designer meetups in person, my online community. I still have people say to me, oh, my friend worked with this designer. Do you know her? And I'm like, no, I do not. Because there are hundreds, thousands of designers. So what is it that you do differently? or that you want to do differently, or that makes you unique. 
And then there's an exercise that I walk you through in that very first ep second episode. Um, and you can get that at, you can get that PDF uh, if you go to RebeccaHay.com slash two. Oh my God, I still can't believe that second episode. I didn't realize that when I pulled this up. Um, it's actually really interesting. Just a sidebar. I was in a Zoom call this morning. I have this kind of accountability group with other entrepreneurs and we talk about what's going on. And the one woman brought up the blue ocean strategy and how someone she's witnessing in the online space is doing things in the blue ocean. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm recording a podcast about that today. It's a sign. Um, so essentially the idea is to do an exercise and I did this exercise. I think I did it back in 2018 or 2019 and it was a game changer and it, it literally changed the trajectory of my marketing in the years ahead. You may not know this because I haven't spoken a lot about it on the podcast. It's not something that I talk a lot about um, or want to really brag about, to be honest with you, but I will tell you now because I think it's relevant. When I shifted my marketing strategy, thanks to this exercise and other resources that I had at the time, things grew exponentially. In the first five years, five years, of my interior design business, I grew my business to a seven figure business. We brought in over a million dollars in sales. And I don't say that to brag, but I say that to say that it is possible for any of you listening in the earliest years of your business to grow exponentially regardless of the economy. And yes, you may not grow as quickly in a recession, but you can still grow and you can stand out. And here's what's the thing about the exercise and that I think, I'm just trying to pull it up so I got a visual. I've got the, all these papers. So essentially it is like a, a graph um, where there's like an X axis and a Y axis. And the book gives you, gives you examples and then the PDF that you can download from me gives you an example. I mean, the book, is, I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna be honest, I never finished reading that book. I skimmed it and I was like, okay, got what I needed. This is so heavy and scientific. <laughs> um, but essentially, it, you, you do a little bit of a graph where you chart out your industry, averages in your industry. And on the X axis, you're putting um, what the offerings are. Um, so sorry, you're putting sort of like a high low, like you're, you're, you're basing it on high importance, low importance, or very common, not so common. And then in the Y, is that the bottom axis, the one that goes along the bottom? I think so. I think I like had the same confusion when I recorded this episode um, in 2020. Uh, you do, uh, sorry, the, the factors of competition. So for example, in, the, in this situation, where if you're looking at an airline, you would look at, you know, what are some factors of competition? Okay, airport lounges, meals, price, friendly service, speed, frequent departures, seating choices, things like that, right? And then you wanna chart, what is the industry average, average that you see in your opinion? So let me give you a more specific example to help you because we're not all running airlines. Uh, if you are, send me a DM. I wanna know about your entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, but here's what I did. I took, on the left, I put low emphasis to high emphasis from bottom to top. So in the industry, where is there a low emphasis and where is there a high emphasis? And then all on the bottom, the factors of competition that I came up with that were relevant to my interior design firm at the time were price. Oh my gosh, I wrote so small. Price, billing practice, full service versus a la carte, brand, creativity, meaning creativity versus more generic design, uh, antiques, attitude, waste, uh, customer service, quality, budget, knowledge, uh, profit margin, environmental impact. Okay, so I had a lot. <laughs> These were things that I thought were important to me. I probably started with just a few and I added more. And if you guys download the PDF, you'll see them. They are very small though and hard to read. I need a magnifying glass. Um, and then I plotted where I thought my company was or I wanted it to be uh, as it relates to all of those factors. And what I found was 
I thought my company scored really high in some areas where the industry scored low. Bing, 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 bing. That was my differentiator. That was the thing I needed to emphasize. I'm not trying to reinvent the interior design business that I have by being completely different because that's not what my intention was from reading the book, but it was how can I take what I've learned and implement it into some marketing and then talk about those things in my marketing, in my Instagram, in my newsletter, when I'm talking to people, um, when I get interviewed for a publication, how do I talk about those things so people start to know me and know and understand that my company does things differently. One of the biggest ones for me was, <clears throat> one of the biggest ones for me was environmental impact. And I can tell you what I did is I ended up picking four pillars from this. I, I did this and I saw, okay, where's the biggest discrepancy between the industry and me? Some, sometimes I was kind of on par with the industry. So like um, branding, I don't think that my brand was like so exceptional or unique or different as far as a visual. Um, what else did I say was kind of similar? Like quality, yeah, I do excellent quality. I can't really speak to everyone else's quality. I didn't know that that was the biggest differentiator for me. Um, knowledge of budgets. At the time, I was really not, and you guys have heard me talk about that here, but like at the time, budgets were something I still really struggled with. So me going on and talking to the general public about how I'm really great at prioritizing your budget and estimating costs, like I would not want to do that because I was not good at that. But the things that I felt strongly about that either we did or I wanted to dive into more were these four things that I then called pillars. So one was full service project management. I had heard from builders that I worked with like, wow, Rebecca, you, you really take it to the next level. Like most designers I work with are not that present in the project management phase, what we call implementation. They're just, they, they design it and, and it's off and it's hard to get them to come back to site. And I thought, oh, that's so weird. I just assumed everyone did it my way. So that was a big one. The other one was attitude friendly, approachable attitude and customer service. I know that we are not snobby. I hire people who are really approachable, who are easy to get along with. All of our clients end up becoming friends with not just me, but the people on our team. And so I thought that was something that was worth leveraging in our marketing. And then the third pillar was organization. Obviously guys, process. Um, and billing process. So like process in general, it was something that I realized I needed to lean into and use as a pillar of my marketing because, and I can tell you now, and you guys already know this, that some of my clients hired me because of my process, because they're like, shoot, this girl's organized. The other designers I talked to kind of felt like they were winging it. I'm going to go with the organized company that seems like they've done this a few times. And keep in mind, I'd only been in business like two or three years at this point. So, so process. And then the fourth pillar was the one I mentioned earlier, which was environmental impact and waste management. And that one I highlighted because that was one that I realized I was so passionate about internally. I would talk about it with my team, but I had never once uttered it to the public. I'd never talked about it on Instagram. I'd never talked about it in the press and I was getting, I was starting to get some publicity. And I realized I'm like, this is a distinguishing factor because I feel so passionate about the environment. Like you guys don't even really know the half of it. Like I can't even, oh my God, when we were just on vacation in Turks and Caicos, actually when you go anywhere, even the Toronto airport, everything goes in the trash. It is so fucking wasteful. Like it makes me angry. Like it's something that I feel like, ve I'm like vehemently, is that a word? Opposed to how the world is dealing with our poor planet. And so I realized, hmm, I'm passionate about this. Yeah, in Turks and Caicos, everything just goes in the garbage and it's all disposable water bottles. What is with single use water bottles, people? Who's still using those? Come on! Ugh. Anyhow, I do use them from time to time myself because that's the culture and that's, sometimes you can't avoid it if you were in a situation, but God, every time I turn the lid and I open a disposable plastic water bottle, my heart like sinks to my stomach. So anyhow, all that to say, I realized I should probably talk about this. This is something that no one else is talking about. At the time, I didn't know a single designer that was talking about the environment. Now it's become a little bit trendy. It's not trendy enough, in my opinion. 
Anyhow, I'm not going to go on my soapbox preaching, preaching, preaching. But um, anyhow, so that's how I came up with those four pillars. And I think that this, what this strategy says to us is that you can be different without changing your business model entirely. Now, if you want to change it, that's one thing. Um, but I think that just those small tweaks in your marketing and your messaging will really help. And this is a great exercise to really get you to think about how you do things or how maybe you want to do things. And maybe you're like, oh, like I kind of want to talk about sustainability, but the one time I did it on Instagram, another designer sent me a DM and said, you should stop talking about this. Buying things is how we stay in business. True story. A big designer said that to me in a DM once. And I was like, oh my God, is that all it's about making money at the cost of the planet? And I got more passionate. <laughs> but seriously, give it some thought. Do this exercise. Okay, sip of my tea. And then I just want to switch gears and talk a little bit about getting the word out and how you do that once you understand what it is that makes you different. Mm. The problem with tea, guys, is that it just doesn't stay hot. It's like cold already and then I have to put it in the microwave. And is it just me, but tea never, tea never tastes the same once it's been in the microwave. All right. Here we go. I'm getting messages on my phone. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's switch gears. Okay, so how do we leverage your unique strengths? How do we now take these differentiators, these pillars, and leverage them to get more clients, to service more people? Um, there are four ways, in my opinion. I mean, there's more than four ways, let's be honest. But there are four key areas that I think, and I've called them the pillars of modern marketing. I did an episode on this too. Uh, you guys can go to episode number seven. I talked about this. Well, guys, I'm really digging into those deep into the archives. There's good stuff in that first season though. I highly recommend you go. I said, I shared like, it was more solos actually in the first season than guests because now I've, I've got like two guests a day emailing me asking to be a guest on this podcast. And I'm like, I have to filter through, make sure they're going to be good for the audience. Whereas back then I was like, can somebody please be a guest? <laughs> Anyhow, so I think there's some really good nuggets in the first season. Marketing your message. Four ways that I think are where you should focus your marketing efforts. One of them is going to be less sexy, but it's probably the most effective, word of mouth. Word of mouth in a service-based business like ours is still the number one way to get people to fully understand who you are and like, know, and trust you. And so if you want to get word of mouth, you need to focus on what are you doing to get those referrals from past clients or even just friends and family or people that are in your realm, realtors, right? Uh, networking, can you network with a realtor? What about a builder? Those are two of the top ways, like reach out, cold call, meet someone for coffee. You know, I've shared that story here before of this Toronto designer that I know <clears throat> who really wanted to work with this one builder and but didn't have any projects and she just kept messaging them and they became like Instagram friends and they're like, hey, let's go for coffee. They went for coffee, got to know each other, understood their business styles, so that when a project came along, the builder thought of her for it. Yeah, it takes some time, and it might take you out of your comfort zone, but you'll probably get some of the better clients that way. And then another way that's easier, actually, which is still word of mouth, in my opinion, is lawn signs. Because <clears throat> when you walk through a neighborhood, chances are there's one real estate agent who dominates that neighborhood? In my neighborhood, it's Josie Stern. She has cornered the market in my neighborhood and now expanded beyond. And when I go to sell my house, I may work with her. I mean, I do have close friends who are realtors, but it'll definitely cause me to think twice. And if somebody else wants to move into the neighborhood or sell their house, of course I'm gonna say, oh, did you talk to Josie Stern? It works. People walk through their neighborhood and they see a sign and they think, well, if that person in that house trusts this designer, I'm going to check them out. 
That's the first way, word of mouth. I don't want you to discount it. I want you to think of that as your primary. How do I connect, and especially in a time of recession, especially, 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 it doesn't cost you anything but time. Get out there, start connecting, find people who are going to refer you. And yes, every referral is not gonna turn into a job. Just accept that a realtor might send you a bunch of leads and none of them pan out. That doesn't mean you should stop nurturing the relationship with that realtor until you start to get clear on the type of project you want and that realtor understands, it might take a bit of a learning curve. Okay, number two, PR, PR. Invest in a publicist, reach out to a magazine, reach out to, <clears throat> to any publication. Try to get yourself in the press, get in the press. There's a lot of conversation about is PR worth it? And I have done a few episodes of the podcast specifically about PR, but when I hired a publicist, my business slowly but quickly took off. It was a lot of work and it cost a lot of money, but I got feature after feature after feature and it elevated my business to a level where I could charge more money because I was like, well, look at me, I'm on the cover of Style at Home magazine, House and Home did a video with me, I was on morning television, and people were like, oh, you must be good. It elevated my, um, what's the word? It was like social proof in a way. And I can tell you, you are good enough to get published. We grow up thinking like, oh, wow, the people in the magazine, I mean, they must be like, exceptionally talented or been doing this for a really long time. No, no, <laughs> seriously, anyone can get in a magazine. I mean, not if it's ugly, but your designer is not gonna be freaking ugly. Like, I'm sorry, like you've seen magazines where you're like, oh, like how is this in a magazine? Or you give it more praise than you would normally because it's on the glossy pages of a magazine. It has nothing to do with the quality of your work. It has everything to do with contacts. Get into a magazine if you can. I'm, I, I, I sound preachy, but I feel like it doesn't have to be, you don't have to hire a publicist the way I did for three whole years, blah, blah, blah. But I can tell you, it helped get me to the seven figures. It was an investment, but it worked. Okay, so you can get published online too. Another really great way, because you can share that on your socials featured in a magazine, uh, you could write an article. This is one of the easiest ways to get into getting published is by you writing an article and then sharing it with a newspaper or other publication or online publication, almost like a blog post, right? And <clears throat> you're doing the heavy lifting for them. All they need to do is publish it. A lot of outlets will be grateful for that. And you could try to get on live TV. Reach out, what does it take? How can you do it? They're always looking for great people to feature. Okay, that's number two. Number three is social media. And I'm saving number four because it's one of my favorites for the end. Number three is social media. I had to say it because everybody thinks that's the only place. But let's be honest. If you are paying attention to where your clients find you, then you know where you need to be. But if you're not paying attention, you probably assume it's social media. And when I say pay attention, I mean, and I talk about this in my end of year review, Oh, I feel like this is a preachy episode, guys. Sorry, I'm just like, feel so passionate about marketing. Um, I, this is something I did not do for the first few years of my business. And when I started to do it, it was so telling. Asking new leads how they found out about me. It's such a simple question. And yet I was like, I felt uncomfortable to ask it in a discovery call. Now I follow my script. So if you don't have that, guys, get my discovery call script. It is free. It's just rebeccahay.com forward slash discovery. So get that. But <clears throat> yeah, I ask that question every time. And if they're like cagey, I try to like ask again in the consultation, right? Oh, I don't remember. It eventually comes out. Um, because you start to learn that most of the people are coming from one or two sources. For me, it was referrals and they'd seen me in a magazine. It was very rarely Instagram. It was sometimes Instagram, but Instagram wasn't the first place. It was like, they found me and then they started to follow me or they heard about me from a Facebook group, uh, a mom's Facebook group, and then they started to follow me. Uh, so the Instagram was important because it helped to build the relationship, but it wasn't the primary place where people were searching for designers and finding them, for me. 
Um, so, okay, so there's all sorts of things you can do with social media. TikTok is the new thing. I can't speak to that. When you are a local business looking for local work, I'm not sure if TikTok's the place. I would probably venture to say, you know, leverage Facebook groups, and I'm not gonna get into all those details today in this episode, but just know that it is a great place to get your brand message out because that's where you can do the posts about the environment, about your full service design, what your process looks like, right? How friendly your team is. That's where you can let people know a little bit more about what it means to be in your realm and to work with you. And then number four is truly one of the most effective other than the word of mouth, but I left it for last because it's not one that people are really paying attention to as creatives often, is your email list. Do you have a newsletter or an email that you're sending? Honestly, send out a newsletter every season, once a quarter, like four times a year at the start. Then maybe send it monthly if you can. It is truly the best way that you can get in front of your client because people see emails. The algorithm now, they're not necessarily seeing it. And you can nurture that relationship. You can share your Instagram information in the email. You can talk about what you do. You can share just resources for those, the people in your city. So here's what's going on. For the longest time, we had a newsletter for our uh, design clients. It was like once a month. And we're like, here's what's coming up in the city of Toronto. And we would put like two or three links to events or things that were happening that were related to design, right? So maybe it was an interior design show or a home show, or maybe there was some cool like art gallery we'd found. And what was kind of neat is we were giving resources to these people that weren't necessarily ready to hire us yet, but they liked to open the email because they felt like I was a knowledgeable source. And so when it came time, to look for a designer, or if their friend was looking for a designer, who are they gonna have top of mind? Me. It's a really great way to connect with your audience, and there's so many ways to start growing that email list, but highly recommend, that could be something you spend a little bit of time on over the, in this quarter of the year, to just get it set up. You know, when I started my email list, it was just friends and family. It was, <clears throat> friends and family <clears throat> and then I figured out like how to give people the link to sign up and then I figured out how to add it to my website then I figured out how to create a lead magnet or an opt-in so someone could could download a freebie I had one about hanging art um, these are all different tactics and strategies that I teach inside momentum eventually I will bring that course back uh, but you can easily google and they're really great ways to get people onto your email list La I think it was last year or maybe it was the year before, there was that, that blackout where like Instagram was like shut down for a day, maybe 24 hours, everyone panicked, like, oh, my Instagram, Instagram's down, it's not working. I was, I truly said to my team, this is why you need an email list. And in fact, I think I emailed my list that day and was like, see guys, this is why you need an email list because I'm still able to get in front of my fans and my people without relying on a social platform that I do not own. All right, that is hopefully a little bit of food for thought. I, I really want to show up with intention this year in the podcast, hopefully also on YouTube. We'll see how that goes just to add more value. And then please tell me, have you tried any of these techniques or tactics? Are they working? What are your differentiators? What are the pillars? Do that blue ocean exercise. Again, you can go to rebeccahay.com forward slash two for that exercise or forward slash seven um, just to get you, your mind turning for the marketing uh, pillars, the sort of marketing 101. But whatever you do, I hope you take the time to focus on your messaging and how you are truly meeting people where they're at, helping them solve their problem so that you are their choice when they go to hire a designer. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. That's it, and I will see you soon.